The rest of us, we're going to be looking at the book of Titus today. We're looking at Titus chapter 3. Start with verse 14. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive <laughs> lives. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. We just thank you for all the great things you've done. And God, as we just go into your service today, we just pray that you please bless this sermon, that it would be found pleasing in your sight. And God, we just pray that in all things I say what is right in your eyes, and that you help us have a greater understanding of your word. We just pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This is the last of what we call the pastoral epistles. This is where Paul is writing to two ministers. He wrote to Timothy in 1 and 2 Timothy. And now he's writing to Titus. To talk to them about the Christian ministry and the things that they need to know and understand in order to be evangelists in the churches that they are serving. As we come to Titus, there's lots of information in Titus. Paul starts to talk to Titus about a simple question. What type of people should we be in this world? Now while he deals with a lot of things in there, Titus often, the book of Titus deals with what type of Christian mature people we should be. From leadership to how we live Christianity into everyday lives and even more. So we're going to examine that today. The Bible describes for us what type of people we should be in this world. And it begins with Christian leaders. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 16. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of both one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkardness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, and who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced, because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, so that they may be sound in the faith, and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupt and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything good. Paul begins here by talking about the fact that a Christian leader must live what he believes. This is not an option. That when we look at both 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1, we see that when we're looking for an elder, and then later on in 1 Timothy 3, a deacon, we are looking for people who not only just believe the right thing, but who live it in their life. He goes through here and says, an elder must know the truth of the scripture and be able to teach it. An elder must be able to teach the truth. But he's, in order to teach it, he has to know the truth. You cannot teach what you do not know. And our elders need to be people who understand thoroughly what the Word of God says and be able to explain it to others. Now that could be in a public setting like here, that could be in a private setting, one-on-one. -on -one. It could even be with our lifestyle. should be all three. Now number two, an elder needs to set an example by the way he lives. The Christian faith must be seen in our lives. Now this is true for everybody. If you are a Christian, 
People should be able to identify that by the way that you live. If your life is a bad testimony and people can't tell what you believe by your actions, then you're in trouble. We must be able to see in our lives the Christian faith is shown in our lifestyle, in our behavior. Now for the elder here, it's his personal holiness, but it also needs to be seen in his family life. It says here, what type of family person are you? Are you a good husband? A husband of one wife? How does he treat his, his wife? How does he treat his children? Does his children respect him and obey him in the Lord? We have to see both. In his personal life, in his family life, his married life, that this person is a person that lives up their Christian life in every instance. And at the same time, not only does Paul tell us how we identify a true shepherd or a true teacher, he teaches us how to identify a false teacher. How do they identify a false teacher? First of all, they reject the truth and they teach lies. Listen to what they teach. <coughs> Christian, you are responsible. I want to say this very loud and clear. You are responsible for what you believe. I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what the teacher says. I don't care what the Bible college instructor says. You are responsible for what you believe in this world. You can't point to somebody else. So when it comes to a false teacher, if you're following a false teacher, that responsibility is on you because you have the ability and capacity to read the Word of God for yourself in this world. We have no excuse for not reading the Bible in this world anymore. It is made in almost any kind of translation you can think of. Those are a little bit higher level of reading. Those are a lower level of reading. And if you don't have time to read, the Bible is on CD, it's on tape, it's on MP3 format. If you have a cell phone, you can play it for free over Bible apps. Never before in human history has the Word of God been so accessible. Even to the point you don't even have to buy a copy anymore. So therefore you are responsible for what you believe. So if a false teacher is teaching lies, not the truth, you need to be able to identify it for yourself. Number two, they live for corrupt desires. Finances. Hey, look, I have no problem with people making a good, solid living in this world. Honestly, I don't. As long as you are obeying the morality of God, I don't have a problem with what you make. However, if you are making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of religion, i got a problem. Because that's not what God's called us to do. And that's where corruption comes in. Or maybe for power. You know, some of the most powerful people in the world are not elected officials, are not CEOs. So most powerful people around the world sometimes can be religious leaders because religious leaders are seeking that power. If you're seeking power, if you're seeking fame, if you're seeking wealth, if you're seeking notoriety, if you're seeking the fact that people just want you just want people to tell you how good you are, then you are in it for a corrupt reason. And that's where false teaching comes in. Because if you're doing it for money, you'll say whatever you have to to get that money. If you're saying it for power, you'll, get, you'll say whatever you have to to get that power. If you're doing it for fame, you'll do whatever you have to do to get that fame. That's where corruption comes in. False teachers can be identified with those two things. God desires Christians with the right beliefs and the right behavior. You can't have one or the other. If you have the right beliefs, it should lead to a right behavior. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. God's going to talk about having the right behavior with the wrong heart. See what he says about it. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward 
from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Look, it's not my business what you decide to give to the Lord. Even though I'm the preacher, that's ultimately between you and God. Ultimately. But when we do something like giving, saying prayers, teaching, helping the needy, and we're doing it so that people can tell us, hey, you're such a good person. We're glad. Hey, everybody, let's recognize this good person. You're doing it for the fame. You're doing it for the notoriety. God says you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And it does not count. That goes with anything that we do. We might have the right behavior, but we have the wrong heart. God says, I want both the heart and the action. <coughs> we might have the right belief system, but not live a right life. And God says, you've got a good belief system, but you don't have the good behavior. I want both, or it doesn't count. We live what we believe. Yeah, here, here this next month, we have fun in our society, don't we? People wearing masks for a day. They put on a little costume, pretend to be something else. In the Bible, that's actually the definition of a hypocrite. One who puts on a mask. That acts like somebody else. It's, it's basically the word for an actor. God doesn't want a hypocrite. He wants a right person who does the right action for the right reason because they have the right belief. But it's not just Christian leaders who are called to live moral lives, but all Christians. So Paul goes in here and starts to talk about that. We'll begin in Titus chapter 2, start with verse 1. You must teach what is, in, uh, what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the ways that they live, not to be slanders or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching of God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives for this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility to all men. Let's first start off with the fact that Jesus' death saved us from all wickedness to make us pure people. The purpose of the cross, and we talked about this Wednesday night, by the way, for any of you guys, it was Wednesday night. The purpose of the cross was to remove sin. The purpose of the resurrection was to defeat death. Two things are equally important. And that's why I say we've got a cross here when you really need an empty tomb over here because both are essential to our faith. But the crucifixion, the crucifixion brought us forgiveness of our sins in order for us to be the moral and holy people of God. Not to continue to live in sin and filth. Now how does that look? Paul deals with how each group of people should live their lives as Christians 
while facing our weaknesses. This is one of those Sundays. I kind of wish that this door here had an entrance to the back because I'm probably going to make somebody mad before the end of the day. Because we're going to talk about things that's maybe a little bit uncomfortable. That's why we really should turn this building around so I can have an easier access to the door if I need it. <laughs> but just to understand, if you feel like I'm stepping on your toes today, understand Paul is addressing this to all Christians and all lives, and we all have to recognize and understand our weaknesses. So be patient with me here as I talk about this. He first of all starts with older men. He said older men are to be temperate, temperate and men of respect. Not men who do not care what others think. So here's one of the things that I've discovered. As men start to get a little bit older, they start to care less and less what people think about them. For the most part. Okay? And you see that, well, I'm going to wear what I'm going to wear because I, I'm getting older and who cares what somebody thinks. I am who I am. If people don't like me, they just don't have to be around me. This is a concept we... Sometimes men will even become a little bit more isolated because of this. Now, this is a problem. This is a serious problem. The other night, I went to the men's fellowship. I wish you guys could come because the guy who did this, the talk did it all on the issues that men deal with. And he starts talking about the fact of the challenges that men face. And one of the things he starts to talk about is how men actually feel like they have few really close friends, if any at all, and how they don't have a real connection in a lot of cases to their father. Now understand this is getting worse in our society because a lot of people don't know their father. But in the previous generations, as men started to go off into the factories and leave the farms, they had actually less time to spend around their sons. <clears throat> And therefore, most men were really raised more by their, their mothers than by the fathers instead of a child being raised side by side with a father and mother who spent equal time with them, teaching them how to work, spending time with them. And what basically the idea was, because men don't have these relationships anymore and because they didn't have that solid relationship with their father, men actually don't know how to be men anymore. Now, look at our society and look at the confusion we've got in it. I'd say there's probably a lot of truth to that. So when we come into here, he says to be men worthy of respect, be temperate. In other words, here's the idea. We need older men to understand younger men are watching you. And they are going to, I had this conversation with a guy yesterday, they, people will mimic what they're surrounded by, and what they see. So in other words, if you're a person that just don't care and are not patient with people and don't want to be around people, guess what? The younger generation is going to think what it is to be a man. To not care. To not care about anyone or anything. To kind of just be all by myself and I'll be who I am and I don't have to change. When we stop changing in life, we start to die. So, older men, your job is to overcome that challenge. It's to say, I am going to live a lifestyle where I am going to live the Christian life, where I am going to be a model of faith, and I am going to <gasps> mentor somebody else. So I was talking to this professor the other day. He teaches at a prison. You know what he said? He said that as he would teach at some of these prisons, he would have men come up to him and say, if I only had a teacher like you when I was in high school, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he said he'd go home and he'd almost be just beating his steering wheel thinking, why didn't somebody just get involved, care, be in this life? You have to be in somebody's life. You have to be an example. And that's what's wrong with our generation today. Our men are isolating themselves away from the youth of our culture. And that's not saying anything negative about women. Guys, don't, 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 don't take that. Understand this. God made us male and female for a reason. 
And when men are isolating themselves from the children and from the young men of our society, we should expect the problems we're seeing. So number two, I'm going to write hit men. None of them have thrown anything at me, so I'm going to roll the dice and start talking about women. This is where I usually get in trouble. <laughs> women are not to be slanders. Older women are not to be slanders, but teachers. Now this word slander, a gossip, or in some cases, it's little devils. Because death the Satan is the accuser. He points his finger and accuses people of their sins. And this, more typically, once again, it goes back to this little patient thing. Sometimes this is the problem. Men have this problem. A lot of times women have this problem. They, they will sit down and instead of when they see somebody having a problem, seeing something where a person doesn't know something, or a person is has just not been taught something, instead of getting up and teaching them, showing them, talk about it. Can I ask you a question? What good does that do? What good does that do? Once again, here's the ad principle and idea here. It says here for the older women to do this so that they can teach the younger women how to be good wives and mothers. I told you a minute ago about how men are forgetting how to be men. We've always assumed in our society that women will just naturally learn how to be good mothers. If you believe that, you haven't been visiting many of the situations our kids are dealing with in our society today. Because it's not just one parent that's neglecting, in some cases it's two. And here's the point here. It's easier. Guys, I, I get it. Trust me, I do. It is easier to sit, to mock, and to talk about people than it is to actually get up and involve in a person's life. Again, I was talking about this. You, you want to know what? Getting people to donate money is a whole lot easier than getting people to invest in time. To give somebody time to teach, to instruct. And so, it, despite what we think about some things being natural, it's actually not. Things have to be taught. And if we're not investing in time and in teaching, we're failing. And the Bible tells here, when you know something, you pass it on. You teach it. And on that concept, we're going to talk about young women. It says, younger women are to learn how to be pure in their lives while loving their families. This is a challenge in our society today. Because our society are not, is not teaching girls how to be pure. In fact, our society is putting the image in their head to be the exact opposite. To get attention with their body or with certain behavior. And look at some of the clothing and stuff that gets passed out there and the image that it's teaching young girls and young ladies. The church teaching purity to, to our young girls is essential. Once again, not talking down to them. Not telling them that they're, they're not mocking them for how they dress or how they act or how they behave. Instead, won't you teach them why? Won't you be patient? Why don't you instruct them? And then loving the family because this is, this is something that is becoming more and more of a challenge. Look, both young men and young women entering into the family have roles that they have to do in their family. The problem is in our society we are blurring the distinction between a man and a woman and, and what they bring to the family unit. And we are confusing our young people about what they need to do. And it's not an easy thing to teach a young person sometimes what it means about the respect and honor of the husband because we see that as something that is 
Meaning, well, you have to be demeaned. The Bible never tells a wife to take a demeaning role in the marriage. That's a misinterpretation coming from a society that does not understand the Word of God. Instead, it is teaching something to keep a law and an order and an accountability in the family. And our young women today are being challenged. Today, not to understand the biblical role that's being given to them. And God gave biblical roles for a reason. And this comes back to the church. Guys, I, I want to tell you right now, and I'm going to say it again, I'm going to repeat myself until I'm sick of hearing it, so that hopefully it will make it past the eardrums and up to the head. If you do not like to see what's going on in society in this world today, and you're not taking an active involvement in teaching our young men and our young women how to be good, decent people in the world, in the workforce, in school, in the church, and in a family, you're part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. We don't need people coming here to complain about what kids are like today. We need people who are saying, I want to help, mentor, teach, instruct. You may have to deal with loud noise. You may have to deal with Kool-Aid on the carpet. You may have to deal with a kid talking back to you because they haven't been told how to be respected. Too bad. We all have to deal with things we don't like. This is not an option in the church. This is a command. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. You can obey this command. Talk about young men for a minute. Young men are to learn self-control, which is to deny the impulses of youth. I'll be honest with you, there is different challenges to come from dealing with young ladies and young men. And in more cases than not, it is that you sometimes want to really grab a hold of a young man because you see that he is not being self-controlled. The anger, the smart aleck response, the laziness, the just self-serving attitude. And so what we have to do is to teach why you just don't give in to those things. And that you have to overcome them. Because that's what gets men into trouble. It's learning not to have self-control. And men have to learn self-control. That's why the older men have to learn self-control so they can help steer a young man into self-control. And guess what? Most young boys, not all, but most young men, I said boys, but all, I mean men, we'll even count people in their 20s and 30s, who have no self-control have nobody guiding them in it. Now that's not to excuse them. If you're having a problem with self-control, you need to learn to get a hold of it before it gets a hold of you. But where young men need the most help is learning to control their own emotion and desires and impulses. Or else they'll get in trouble. Fighting, partying, sex. These are all things that are self-control issues that young men have to grab a hold of, have to become disciplined so that they can lead good lives, be good fathers, be good husbands, be good teachers, be good role models. Or else society crumbles. And guys, I want to say it right now. As the men go, so do the families go. When a husband and father is not engaged in the life of their children, statistics always show children just get worse, not better. A lot of guys who end up in prison do so because they had no father <coughs> in their lives. And you know, that childhood <coughs> of a child, that's when a young man is in a 
younger age, and he has to learn self-control and to be physically involved in his kid's life. One that most of our society doesn't understand is Paul deals with slaves. Now you can put um, servants, you can put employees if you want to here. Slaves were told to make the faith look appealing by how they served. Now, for a slave, this was hard. They could be killed legally. They could be beaten legally in Rome and in other societies. And Paul says, I understand what your problem is, but you have got to learn to serve in a capacity where your masters would want to become a Christian. Didn't mean that their life was perfect. Didn't mean that they really had to rejoice in the fact that they was made a slave. But they had to serve in such a capacity that they made the faith look good. And when you're out working, you may not like your employer. Don't have to like your employer. Don't have to like your customers either. But you have to live a life and serve in a life that makes it look good. Citizens were told to obey, be obedient, even though the Romans were not always good to Christians. They persecuted them. Nero would dip them in tar and light them on fire just to have a chariot path. So next time you think that your government is abusive, at least understand they're not doing that to you. Hey guys, government's not always right. We do have to have an obedient mindset, not a rebellious mindset, or else the world and our society crumbles. And by the way, Christian, if you don't like your government, I want you to understand something. We actually elect our officials. And everybody's complaining about how they don't like the two options this year. <laughs> our two options re actually reflect where our heart of our country is right now. So if you don't like your options, if you're not repenting, you're not going to solve anything. The Christian life is not always easy, but we need to demonstrate it with our lives. In every single aspect. By the way, we're to be good people, not uh, divisive people. Titus chapter 3, start with verse 3. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us graciously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But void foolish controversies and genealogies, and arguments and quarrels about the law, because those are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn him a second time, after they have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. At one time, all Christians lived in sin, but now we should live for holiness since we've been redeemed. And this needs to be in every aspect. If you have been redeemed, then you need to show it, because you have been saved from sin, not to go live in sin. And we should live and reflect lives that reflect that. Therefore, we should be people who are, um, we should not be people who are always looking to cause trouble. You ever known that person that would argue no matter what? You could walk outside and say, man, the sun is out, and they would walk outside and look directly at the sun and say, no, it's not. Just so they could argue and fight. And get you started on something. Yeah, I've known them. That's not the type of people Christians should be. Sometimes arguments are unavoidable. Sometimes we do have to stand for the truth. And when we stand for that truth, it is actually taking a stand that's not popular and sometimes causing a quarrel. <coughs> but we shouldn't be happy about it. I meet people all the time that's happy when they take somebody off. Why are you happy about that? That's not something to brag about. Anybody can brag about making somebody else mad. I can make anybody mad once I get to know them. That's not something to brag about. It's a lot harder to bring peace than it is a fight. 
Let's not be people who always look to cause trouble. Trouble comes because we're taking the right stand. We can't help that. But it doesn't mean we have to go out and look for a fight. See, the question is, will we remain who we are or will we change? It's a fundamental question we're asking today. Because ultimately we have to ask the question, what does your life say about your faith? What does it? Can people tell that you're a Christian? Does your life reflect it? Are you being involved? What does your life say about your faith? Are you willing to change it? If you need to change your faith or your life today and reflect the teachings of Jesus Christ and submit to Him, we encourage you to do so as we stand and sing your invitation song.